Hi, everybody. This is a wee bit of alchemy. I'm Rick Barrett. Welcome. First thing we, that we'd like to uh, play with is an idea, a question that came up in, in the, uh, before, the, before the show was uh, about muscular tension, in, particularly in, in, in the hamstring area, in the backs of the thighs, and, and how that, uh, uh, particularly if it's, it's a um, more of a, a nervous thing rather than a muscular thing, that there's like a, a, a stabbing pain back there. And so uh, looking at that, and uh, Richard had a, uh, had a suggestion, a, uh, an idea that Sharon uh, had given him to, uh, to help with, uh, with, with his thighs. So uh, we're gonna give you, uh, give you the floor there, Richard, and you uh, play with that. To stretch. Um, this, this is uh, <clears throat> it's something that helps me a tremendous amount, and it derives from isometric stretching exercises that Sharon has done with me uh, and taught me uh, a lot of different ways, but this is particularly good for the hamstrings when they start to get cramped up. And I drive a lot and sometimes that's a problem. And basically what you do is you stretch down till you can feel a stretch in your hamstrings. And then you tighten your hamstring muscles. Come up an inch. You come up an inch, you tighten your hamstring muscles as much as you can. And then you release, you go down then you go down further, come back. come back up an inch, tighten your hamstrings, four or five seconds, release, down farther, back up an inch, tighten your hamstrings, release, stretch down farther. That's it. And I don't know if you can see, but I'm getting closer and closer to the floor every time. So my are hands knees, are, are knees straight. Pardon me. Are your knees locked? Uh, pretty, pretty much. Not tight, but yes, straight. So that you stretch that hamstring. Okay. Uh, well, let's 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 try that. Okay. You want to lead us in the uh, in that exercise there, Richard? Well, I I'll do it, and Sharon can talk. Okay. Either so way, sure. you're, 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 the, you're leading the band right now. Okay. So if everybody would stand up straight. And basically you're going to just like you're doing a, going to stretch your hamstrings and kind of find what your barrier is. You got it. All right. Everybody's going to be in a different place. Knees are relatively straight. Find that barrier. Now come up one inch and now tighten your thighs, your, your hamstrings, the back of your thighs, and then release and see if you go down a little further towards the floor. And then move back up an inch, about an inch. Tighten your hamstring muscles once again. Four or five seconds. Release the muscles and see if you go down further. And one more time, come up about an inch, tighten your hamstrings. Make sure you're breathing. And once again, go down. Release. Release. And just. You can do that as many times as you want um, until you, you get closer and closer to the floor, of course. Yeah. Did anybody make any progress with that? Sure. Sure. That uh, felt good. It's a, it's a, it's a very quick one. You can do that very quickly and gain, yeah. you know, a lot of stretch. Excellent. That it works for me when, if I've been driving and my hamstrings start to really cramp up, I just stop, get out of the car, do this for two or three minutes, and I'm good for another hour. Great. Good. I love a good stretch. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, moving on. Um, the next question came up was, was regarding how do we release the butt tension? 
whenever we, um, uh, particularly whenever we're putting a, a load in, we're, like in the last week when we did our, our, our qua exercise using a chair, the, uh, the idea is to be able to release your, your glutes and take the load into the front part of your thighs, into the vastus medialis, and be able to let go of back tension, let go of your, your butt tension as you do that. And then to be able to carry that forward into other activities, into walking, standing, etc. just be able to do that. And so the, it's, uh, it's a shift in terms of your relationship to your body since we have a uh, we have patterns that have been established for decades probably since you were a uh, you know a year old and uh, about how your body feels safe and feels comfortable and so it triggers what's uh, what's called the tendon guard reflex whenever you are at all it's uh, at all under stress or all uh, uh, your, your balance is at all question. It initiates in the Achilles tendon and it shoots up your leg as tightens up the tissues above it, tight, particularly along the superficial back line of fascia and locks things up. And it's just, it's a way of, of your initial response to falling over is to, to kick in this thing. It's a pre-conscious response. It's not something you you activate by thinking about it. It's something that happens automatically. And which is fine. You don't want to lose that. But at the same time, you don't want to have it so you can't turn it off. Because if it is locked in, then you'll find that the tissues get, particularly if you are uh, leading an existence which has numerous stresses in it that you find that that gets locked up and maybe even while you're asleep you'll find that you're you're tightening up and you'll find that you know you you wake up and and your 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 legs are are locked your butts locked your there's a a, a sense of exhaustion from from having worked so hard while you're sleeping and yeah, I think while you're dreaming or whatever, the things get you know, stimulated. Your sympathetic nervous system gets stimulated, and and if your response to that is to lock up, then you'll find that that's going on a lot of the time. And over time, that then becomes a a feedback loop. In other words, your that will stress will trigger that response, which will then trigger stress, which will then trigger that response, and that'll keep going more and more. So your body gets into a, a pattern, a habitual pattern, where that is where you feel safe. You feel safe when you're tight-assed. And, uh, and the problem with that, many problems with that, most of the biggest problem is that it blocks your energy north-south, so you end up uh, disconnecting from your earth chi, it affects the way your hips work. So you're not able to get sun qua. You're not able to, to release your hip, hip joints and be able to really sink into that, which then means that your tai chi chuan is going to suffer. You're not going to get that, the full benefit from your practice. It, by keeping the energy, the energy from your upper body, it's unable to ground. So then it tends to rise and get stuck in your head. And then you kind of get into heady stuff, mental perseverations and loops, thought loops, things like that. Your, um, your, the, the yin chi of the earth is not allowed to rise past, past your hips except for a, a trickle. And then, so consequently, you don't get that nurturing, supportive energy from the earth. So what happens is the body then says, okay, I'm on my own here. I'm going to have to tighten up in order to protect myself. So then we get back into that loop again. So being able to, even a little bit, be able to start to let go of that, of that um, 
tension in your glutes and to be able to feel the support on the front of your thighs, which will feel weird when you first start doing it because it's not how most of us operate. It's something that it's way we're designed, but it's not, uh, it's not a common way of moving, common way of holding ourselves. Unless you play a lot of soccer and then you, you get your, that muscle will start to get a, uh, will get, uh, will get a workout. But most of us, we don't get that. So being able to do that, um, really start to count on your, the front part of your, your thighs and do it in a, 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 a yin way. That is your, your yielding, your soft and sinking into the, the, the support rather than pushing away from the earth, then you start to be able to let go of this other tension. So uh, let's just go over that again and I'll, I'll talk you through it because I think it's a really important thing. One thing I didn't mention, I don't think much but I did in the past, but it's, it's real important for knee health because the that muscle is the one, one of your muscles that that I think the only one that connects your kneecap with your with your hip bone, and so your the support you get from you know to center and control your knee is uh, directly related to the health and tonal, ton, tonality of your of your vastus medialis. So you want to you want to have that as a uh, just there as a, a, an important thing for keeping your knees healthy. So in turn, I know whenever I uh, tore the meniscus in both knees, uh, like a year and a half ago, I, uh, I was looking at surgery and decided I was going to try to rehabilitate it because my knees were swelling up. They were, you know, it was becoming a very big painful problem for me. And um, it was affecting my tennis game quite a bit. So I, uh, so I started to play around with this and I started to work on ton tonifying my, uh, you know, the anterior parts of my thighs and something I had used to do when I was playing push hands uh, a lot and, and it kind of slipped out and then I got it back and, and my knees were very responsive and the, the um, meniscus problems are, are not bothering me. You know, I don't know if they've healed or not, but they're not a problem. So I never, I don't have a, I don't think about it and I can play, you know, tennis and whatnot without, without any knee pain. So anyway, the, uh, let's do this. Uh, why don't you stand up? And we'll just go, go over this one again. Okay, the idea here is that I'm going to feel the ball of my left foot. I'm gonna pick up my right heel. So all my weight is in my, my left leg. Okay, I set my knee. So the knee's not gonna move. And I'm gonna keep my hand on the chair here. So it's not gonna do much in the way of support, but it's there just as a, as a guide. And I think it's real important to practice with a chair because otherwise you're gonna to tend to clench your butt. And this way, you if you don't have a, uh, a, a fear that you're gonna fall over, then you're able to let go more. And then you just gradually bow forward without pushing your butt back. So you're bowing forward, keeping your back straight and seeing how much tension you can let go in the backs of your legs, in your butt and in your back. And then come up. So notice I'm not pushing away from the earth. I'm just rocking from the hip joint and I bow forward again. And don't, you don't have to go very far because what it's happening is you're bowing forward so your, your weight is out over, over your foot. So it's this, um, a, a place where your, the alarm system in your body mind is going to start ringing some bells, which is what's going to alert your, your, your muscles to, uh, to tighten up. And so with that, it, it, the case, then you say, okay, what can I let go of? And you do it again, you come up and you bow and you do it again. And notice that as you're going down, maybe you're holding on, but then you 
you get down, you find a comfortable, safe spot, and you say, what can I let go of? And really feel the load in your, in your left leg and come up and bow forward. Release, sink. You know, the, and you really want that, that back leg to be really empty because you want any tension in your, in your right hip is going to cause your left hip to tense up also. So you want to let that go. You want to really feel soft and gooey there. And you come up and one more bow. And you're letting go. You're relaxing. You're sinking. You're ah oh, down, down, down. And up. And notice that your leg is probably feeling that. You're feeling like, oh, I got there, there's there's a workout there. And that's good. You want to want to have that feeling. But it's not the same thing as doing like squats where you're that young energy of pushing away. It's a different, a different way of using your muscles. Okay, and uh, let's go uh, with the, uh, the right leg now. So feel the ball, set the knee, pick up your left heel. So you're really sinking down, getting nice and relaxed. And bow from the hip joint. So the knee says set. It doesn't move. You're bowing straight forward and then coming up. And bow. And this is as much an awareness exercise as anything else. You're seeing what kicks in when your body gets that sense like, uh oh, I'm going to fall. What kicks in? And you say, okay, relax. See, I didn't fall. And bow forward. So you're shifting the uh, support into the tensegrity of the whole system. It's running continuously throughout the whole system there. So rather than it coming from the localized muscular tension in your butt and come up, it's, you're feeling it kind of spread out and bow. Up, and one more, bow. What can I let go of? Relax, let go, soften, really just feel. You can actually feel your butt and see how much, don't expect it to let go of everything, just you're moving in that direction. You want to have a release of some tension in the butt there and coming up. And it's something that you're gonna take some time to develop, but it's really uh, a valuable tool for developing Sun Kwa and for getting a really stable posture in your, in your Tai Chi Chuan. Any questions on that? How'd that go? Yeah, Richard. Um, <clears throat> I have just this same problem in my right knee um, probably a torn medial meniscus. And uh, when you first started doing this, uh, was there, did you have a feeling of instability, crack, crackling, crinkling in your knee when you were doing it? There, there might be some of that. Yeah, there might be some of that. It just, your uh, things get kind of, uh, energy gets stuck and you get these crystal formations and things like that. And, you know, if it, if you're feeling sharp pain, you're doing something wrong. But if it's just uh, things just- Just snap, crackle, and pop. Then it's, uh, it's um, you know, it's something that you work through. And, okay. uh, and uh, just nice and easy. Yeah, because nice I've easy. been, when, when you first showed us this, I, I tried doing it for uh, quite a while and I sort of, stopped because I was concerned about the crackling. <laughs> yeah, I think the crackling comes more from inactivity okay. from, than it does from, from this kind of activity. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna become devoted again, so thank you. Cool. You bet. Keith, you got something? Well, 
uh, just as a comment, I felt that that was a really good exercise to strengthen the front of the thighs. And as Val says, what she uses her squishy, squishy butt thing uh, <laughs> to try just to take the tension away from that. You know, I that was a really good, oh, you know, that? exercise to work on because I it caused me no stress at all. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Cool. How's it go for you, Nick? I I'm still puzzling, so but that's okay. <laughs> As a, I, there's a point. I mean, I can. There's a point. I'm trying to to suss out. That's the balance point between the amount of work it has to actually do as part of the pair that keeps you upright and tension, excess tension. Because if you if you have nothing in it at all, then you are going to fall over because you've lost the balance in the system. So that's that's my question is like, we start off with squishy baby butt, nothing's happening there. And then you put that weight on the front of the leg and it's definitely no problem, it's in the front of the leg. I don't feel unstable. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and my butt's still pretty soft, right? But then at, at some point, as you're leaning forward, the outside of the butt begins to engage, not through, I don't, I don't feel like it's through like a, a kind of a, you know, reaction, but just through, it's like stepping up to share the labor with the front of the leg. Um, am I just telling myself a story that isn't true? <laughs> um, or do I need both as I go further down or? I, I, that's, that's, well, you're going down pretty far there. So, uh, I would say that you're, you're exploring new territory. So get back to us on that. <laughs> yeah, <I'll be> <laughs> um, I, I'm really focusing on it mainly as a remedial exercise for people who are not as, as uh, uh, experienced at it as you are. And so it's something that is helping people. I mean, I would say well over half, well over half the people I deal with, if they go forward one inch, they start to freak out. So it, uh, so what you are doing there, you're going forward a couple of feet. So it, uh, and, and that's great. So at, the, at that point, um, you don't need this particular exercise if you're able to 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 feel really relaxed and and go forward that far. Then it's just like you're then you're exploring like okay, what's the optimum in this? It's not it's not a uh, an either or that's it in that situation. This this reason why I isolate this muscle is not because we want to forget all the other muscles. It's because we want to. This is this is the. Uh, uh, this is the, the one that got left behind. This, this is the one that most people have seriously underdeveloped. And this is a remedial exercise for that. Cool. Scott, you had something? Um, I was going to say, um, I wasn't coming down near as far as what Lynn was, but that's where I noticed it started tightening up was the outside. And just as Rick was directing, you know, I was keeping my awareness there and softening that as much as I could to the point of where I released quite a bit of it. Um, so I, I agree with what he said as far as uh, uh, being more remedial, you know, rather than going down just as, you know, as Lynn goes down. Uh, but yeah, just being mindful of where I'm feeling that tension and no matter how far you're, you're going down, whether it's two feet like you or one inch, be mindful of where that tension kicks in and releasing it. And I mean, I actually would put my hand on my butt and, and feel, okay, is it squishy, squishy baby butt again? Or is it, is it still there? But right. I was able to release most of it. Yeah. Right. And so it, this is, is an exercise an exploratory exercise. It says, okay, what can I do? How, can, how far can I take this? 
and uh, and with the the goal of letting it uh, uh, of having it make you stronger, better, you know, more stable, more relaxed, you know, have that effortless power, and and also to be able to do really cool stuff as you get much older, which is also kind of fun, you know, where, you know, so much of people are, are studying Tai Chi just so they don't, they don't fall over. And what we want to do is, no, no, we want, we want to be better in 10 years than we are now. You know, I want to be better in my eighties than I am in my seventies, you know, and, and so that's the, that's the game. What, what can we do to cheat that? Yeah, Scott. I actually don't, my, I don't tighten my butt up. I have the bad habit of tightening up like my lower back uh -huh. and, and even arching my back, arching my back to do that. So same exercise. Yep. It's just, it's just a mindfulness exercise. Yeah. It's a mindfulness I'm exercise. Cool. Okay. Moving on. Um, breaking habits. What? I wanted you to get to the thing you discussed about the progress. Um, we'll buy people fit that into this. So the uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maria's excited about something we were talking about this morning. But the uh, the question came up is is if you consider yourself a creature of habit that you like to do things a certain way in a certain order and and whatnot. How do you how do you shift that around? And um, I'd like to narrow that down to your Kung Fu. And because from that, you can extrapolate outward and, and fit those lessons into any part of your life you want. And the, um, I think the most important part about this is to value it. You know, it's, it's if you do not value novelty, as uh, in your life, then you're going to have a hard time uh, breaking out of the uh, out of the same same old same old. It's because we derive a certain level of comfort from habits. They it's ah good a, a routine great. I I know exactly what to do and I can do this. I can check that box and and I know this is going to happen at this time. And so we can have certain predictability, which then enables us to, to calm the nervous system out of that predictability. And we can say, okay, good. I know there are no surprises today. And um, so the, in order to be able to get out of that, you have, it has to be important to you to do that, that uh, you have to have a reason to, to want to break those habits, to break the break that uh, break those patterns, and um, for me, it's essential to survival. To be able to continue to encounter novelty in your life, to continue to surprise yourself on a, on a regular basis, and I would say do. My, my motto is do something weird every day. And that is, what that does is it requires your brain to make new neural connections. And so what we tend to do is, particularly as we kind of move into the second half of our lifespan, is to kind of weed out the novelty and get things so that we have that predictability, that comfort that comes from that. And as a result, the brain actually gets smaller. It gets, it loses neural connections because all those little back roads that we used to travel on are now just being kind of merged into super highways. And consequently, the opportunity of the brain to 
to look around and say, ooh, what's that? Ooh, what else is possible? It, it goes away, that curiosity goes away. So getting a, a higher tolerance of novelty as not just as something we must suffer through, but as something that is desirable, that is something that is, oh no, this is what I want to do. I want to go, I always drive this way to the grocery. Well, I'm gonna drive this other way. I'm gonna take, uh, take different, a different route home every time. You, you start to you know, have to deal with, with, with the novelty. And that's why in our Kung Fu, we are constantly challenging, we're constantly stressing the system so that we can build these new neural connections, which enable us to not be overwhelmed by the surprises that life presents us. So learning how to do that, the first and, and most important step is to wanna. You gotta wanna like doing that. If not, you're just gonna go back to what feels, feels comfortable. And that means that, you know, if you drink your tea with your right hand, drink it with your left hand. If it, you know, you uh, walk backwards down the street, uh, you know, all kinds of, if you do your form a particular way at a particular speed, speed it up, do it in a different part of your, of your space. Um, learn, a brand new form do something that you've never done before speed it you know if you're if you do it with a uh, fajin do uh what what look at each thing and uh, and explore it and say what what can i do with this monkey around with it and you know the 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 thought the, the mantra that goes through my mind on a regular basis is what else is possible. Anytime I see something, you know, and say, this is how it is, I say, yes, this is how it is, great. Now, what else is possible? And you go and you say, you know, you, you look at it and you say, oh boy, I accept you and love you exactly as you are. Now, what else can we do with this? You know, how can we make up something more, more interesting, more fun, better than what we've got? And so that uh, it, you end up, your life becomes art. So now I've kind of made the jump here from Kung Fu into, into life, but it's the same, same kind of deal. Your, your art, your martial art is an art to the extent that you are just following the patterns that were handed down to you by your teacher and his teacher before him and, and her teacher before him and whatever. That's, uh, um, you're going to get, Am I conforming to this set of rigid rules? That's that's kind of the thing. And uh, I drive some comfort from having this, knowing that I am doing it exactly like my teacher did. And uh, but if you then say, no, I'm going to do it different, then you start to wake things up. Then you start to say, oh, what's what? And then you may come back to what uh, what what was successful before, the way you learned it before, because it worked better. But you want to at least try. So that uh, um, that's some of my thoughts on 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 the uh, on the idea of breaking habits. Uh, any questions or thoughts on that? One of my analogies that I've used my whole life is like I have I have a couple triads that I use, and one of them is only the curious have something to find. So if you're not like trying to change stuff up and look and be curious, then you're just walking by everything. So agreed. Agreed. Cool. Okay, so moving on. Um, this kind of feeds into the thing that uh, I was looking at, at, at exploring and that is the idea of progress because um, in talking with people, I'm uh, finding that there is some resistance even to the idea of progress in your, say, in your Taiji, that that it's not a, uh, it's not something that they feel is desirable 
or something they want to think about, that it actually feels counterproductive. And uh, my thoughts on this is, it's it's really important. It's important because it's a it's a way that you have of seeing where you were and where you are now and where you're going. And I think that's just like what I'm talking about with the novelty. It's a a way of maintaining your health, the health of your body and the health of your mind by continually creating new novel, novel uh, situations and awakening to other possibilities. Keep asking those questions. And then you are allowing yourself to explore deeper. The, uh, there's, you know, two sides of the same coin. One's everything has an inner and outer and an outer. That is, if, if I'm looking at it and thinking about it, that's the outer. That's, I am outside of it and saying, ah, oh, this is it. So if I'm looking at Rick and saying, okay, what progress have you made over these last 40 some years of uh, pursuing these Chinese internal martial arts? I can, I then have to look at this Rick as an object, as a, you know, I have to objectify and say, plot against time, the events of my life and say, okay, what have I progressed in and what, what have I, have I not? And am I moving in the direction I want to go? And so you, you get a chance to, to evaluate if you're, what you are doing is what you want to do. Is it, is it leading you in the direction where you want to, uh, where you want to be headed? So the other side is the process part. That's where you're in it. You're doing your, if you're, ah, oh, you're feeling that, you're not thinking about progress right now. You're just thinking about, oh, well, how does my wrist feel pushing against this space? You know, just like, oh yeah, oh, that feels good. You're in the present moment. There is, you are inside of your form. You're inside of your process and you're in the process, so you're you're not looking at and thinking about it. So, but if it's all that, then maybe you have no idea of 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 what you're learning or how it fits into anything else. You need to be able to step back and say, "Oh, oh yeah." So, you know, you can look at it and say, "Okay, I need to learn this form," and okay, that's that's. If I can get to the end of the form and not fall over, great, that's, that's progress, okay? Good, now I need to be able to do that form on my own without having just following along, but I need to be able to do that on my own. Great, okay, that's progress. Okay, now I can have it so well under, under my control that I can do it in front of other people and feel okay about that. That's more progress. You know, I took another route and I went, I said, okay, now I'm going to do it in front of other people and have them grade me on it. So I did tournaments. I, you know, practice that, you know, and so you did that same thing with push hands. You learn the basic skills of it. Then like, okay, now, okay. I want to not just compete. I want to win. All right. Then you get to, okay. Now winning was nice, but I want to win in a way that I feel good about. So then you go and you, that's progress too. You keep looking at it. You set these things, set these little markers for yourself that allow you to contemplate for at least a moment that, yeah, had a boy, Rick, way to go. And in which case you, you get this dopamine hit and oh boy, and you feel, you know, you feel, you feel good. And that contributes to your brain health. That contributes to the health of your body that allows you to get more oxytocin and more dopamine and, and oh boy, oh boy. And it's not the only part of it, but that's, you know, part of the progress is now I want to be able to calm my crap down and be able to, ah, to be able to just be, and that's progress too. How fast, how thoroughly can I be able to move? How quickly does it take for me to reclaim my nervous system to be able to say, 
say, uh, you know, a, a thing I do commonly in, in classes, you know, grab someone by the wrist and say, OK, now I want you to push me. And like the, the, that response, that stress response kicks in like, ah, Rick's got my wrist. I'm going to die. And uh, you say, you know, it, if you can learn to overcome that and say, oh, well, I just do this and and the problem is solved. So you are learn to control your autonomic nervous system and that changes things too. So there's more, more, more to go on this, but I'd like to hear a few people. So we've got a few minutes left here. A few people's thoughts or questions on this before we uh, go any deeper into that. We can go back to it later. I get some other ideas. So, so anybody? Lynn. I understand how your people who say, ooh, don't talk to me about progress, that ruins it. Um, I kind of understand where they're coming from um, in that. So I'm gonna use the example of cycling. I love to cycle. When I first was starting out and getting stronger and stronger, people were like, you should compete. You, you, know, you, should, you should race because you're good. And I said, no, because that would make it a job, right? That would take the, the sort of joy out of it. And, you know, I would have to, you know, jam things and I would have to, you know, do intervals and I would have to do, you know, all these things. I would get better. I would make progress toward that kind of better. But I didn't want that. Right. And I didn't want that. I saw that as bringing stress. Right. And I think for some people, that's how they see, you know, having a, a goal that they have to meet, then they have to become stressed about it in order to get there. Um, and so that's just the other side of you know how why some people might think that progress sounds sure, sure. bad or scary. Yeah. Well, well it, there, there are lots of ways that one can can have a um, a bad relationship with progress. Yes. Right. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's well said. And that, that is one of them. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. Nick. Well, I was just going to say the word sometimes the way it's used, sometimes it implies an end game, right? You're pro progressing towards a specific point. You know, you're trying to get to someone rather than just kind of enjoying the journey while you're along the way. I mean, knowing that the that that every time it's every it's always different. It's always new. It's always something, you know, and, and that in itself is a kind of progress but it's a more wishy-washy aimless sort of progress can we have both can we have yeah. both sure can we can you we know what, that's, go that's towards actually, something and 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 at the same time enjoy the ride yeah. you know that's pretty astute rick because that's half of it like i didn't know lynn you were a runner i've run 10 marathons i wear out my feet I probably figured I did 30,000 miles because I just wanted to win. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> That's an unhealthy relationship to progress. And the tarmac, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> so there, there are lots of unhealthy relationships to progress, but if we look at it as both the inner and the outer, progress and process as two, two sides of the same thing, and that if you're able to enjoy the hell out of that running a marathon, then you know it's it's becomes doesn't become such a uh, a torturous event. You know, it's something that you you do because you like it. You know, and uh, and you even if even if it's going experiencing a the severe discomfort, which you inevitably will. You know, it. Uh, it's part of that that process that that you say, yeah, this is. I embrace the pain. I embrace the uh, this because it's a uh, it's a, a something that is enabling me to play a game that I want to play. Really, it's just like there's no feeling when you reach the finish line and it stops after twenty six point two miles. I bet. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote a blog a few weeks ago about uh, 
after I guess it was a month or so ago now, but you know, right after the Australian Open, and and just watching how uh, Rafael Nadal, you know, was able to come back from the brink of elimination, and and beat someone in in a uh, you know he was down two sets to love and was facing elimination in the third set, and then she just kept chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, and came back and won. And, uh, but his process is he loves the suffering. He lo it's, it's not, it's something that is part of, part of the game for him. It's like, yes, I love the suffering. That is fulfilling. And it's a reason why he does what he does is because there is, he knows that he's right there at the edge. He's, you know, playing against guys who are like, 10 years younger than him and he's still playing and he's still winning. And it's because he embraces the stress and the stress is, is your friend. It's not, not, not your enemy, but mm -hmm. it, and it, your relationship to it, just like your relationship to progress can be a, uh, uh, one that is, uh, a dysfunctional relationship because stress is essential for survival. But if you, uh, if you have a dysfunctional relationship with stress, then it will wear you down and grind you under and spit you out. So uh, it's learning to be able to shift that. And that goes back to progress. You being able to encounter the stresses that one encounters always when one seeks to be more seeks to expand one's ability. And if you don't, if you're not expanding your contract, because the universe has a way of, of pushing entropy upon you if you're not, uh, if you're not willing to, to get a little bit bigger, embrace a little bit more. Jonathan. Nadal, of course, is a creature of habit. It's a, uh... You know, I, I hear what you say about novelty, but I guess people of that level of genius and depth in one area, like tennis or Beethoven with music or Kant with philosophy, perhaps they can be creatures of habit and still get a lot of novelty because of how deep they're going within their one chosen area of concentration. Yeah, we all need certain things that we can count on, certain things that, that are stable. So right. he's a guy who likes to have his water bottle set up just so and he says it's his meditation he says it if i do that it brings me back right. he's just he's just gone through a 35 shot point right you know and he is exhausted and what does he do to bring himself back oh i'll go back and i'll adjust my water bottles oh good right, right. that's just Don't his mess meditation. with the water bottle. Right. so that that's his meditation it's not like he's right. a he's ocd it's he's said no no this is what i do this is how i this is how i bring myself back into present time and end that previous point and start over now is an entirely new point and so it's uh it's a, it's actually quite genius to to do that you know and it's something we all do but if uh, you know the question came up like how do i break out of habits and that's when the habits are owning me and i'm not owning them you know mm -hmm. so there's a habit because what he does would probably better be called a ritual than a, than a habit, you know? So if we're feeling that I have to do it a certain way, then we want to say, alter just some piece of that. What piece of that can I take responsibility for and say, oh yeah, I will do this slightly different just to show that I'm driving a bus. And then <laughs> Valerie, you had something? That's great. Rather than having to change the whole ball of wax, just change a portion because I'm driving the bus. Okay. That that's 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 a really great thing. Great thing. I like that. Um, I right now um, mentioned this uh, in another segment. Um, I'm learning a new form, and I know that there is going to be an end to being able to do the movements profit sort of proficiently 
there's one part that I can't stick quite. And I'm not stuck on having to do that excellently. It's like, okay, I can do it sort of half-assed. But every time that I start from the beginning and do it over, you know, I get to that point and I either am not good at it or it's like, ah, and I see the progress. Um, and I'm taking it very slow. You know, I'm not, not trying to, I'm not in a race with myself to finish this thing. I want to be able to finish it and remember it and be able to do it proficiently each time that I start from the beginning and complete it. Um, so yes, the getting better and the progress. I'm, I'm having a little mind shift here on, on progress. That's, yeah. that, that's, that's great because, you know, I mean, if I learn all of the, the movements, it's like, well, what now? It's not, it's more what else is possible. And that's to keep improving, you know, to keep progressing. Um, I mean, right now I can, I can do this in front of my students and they don't know anything. So they don't know if I'm good or not. So I'm not afraid to do it in front of some people. Um, my test will be able to do it in front of Lynn because Lynn knows the same, well, Lynn and Nick. And they'll probably put me a new one here and there, but that's, and that's fine. That's, that's why we would do it together. And, you know, I'd want, you know, feedback, but uh, yeah, I can very much appreciate what you're talking about as far as the progress and, and keep going forward and seeing improvement um, and, and not feeding myself up and I'm creating new neural pathways. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Richard, um, as we're talking, I'm thinking that uh, a measure of progress should be your ability to maintain joy in the activity. Um, and that can come a lot of different ways. It can come from getting a little better at a particular mm. physical movement, or it can come at being uh, really happy that you've done what you did today. Uh, yeah. So, so I think that if I think that's a good way to define progress, maintaining joy in the activity. Uh, I like it. I think that that's a healthy relationship with progress. Yes. <laughs> well, yes. Well, uh, you, know, you can have a sadomasochistic relationship with progress that would keep you joyful. But, <laughs> but yes, that's a positive relationship. OK, one more, Jonathan. Yeah, going with that, Richard, there was a grump. She said a definition of progress is also resisting the forces of regression. So insofar as you're getting bored, you're regressing away from joy, and that tells you you're not making progress too. Okay. Cool. Okay, thank you, everybody. This has been great. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Bye. Love everyone. <laughs>